Welcome to the NCDWI Guy podcast, where defenders of the Constitution assemble to prepare for courtroom battle, and firm owners gather to develop marketing strategies that will revolutionize the practice of criminal defense. Here's your host, the NCDWI Guy, Jake Minnick. Hello, fellow freedom fighters, and welcome to episode 153 of the NCDWI Guy. On today's episode, we have a very special guest. Robert Kelly Corbett III is on the podcast today. This man is a courtroom warrior, an absolute warrior. Let me let me read you a quote of, of uh, how I kind of look at at uh, Rob, out of every 100 men, 10 shouldn't even be there. 80 are just targets. Nine are the real fighters. And we are lucky to have them for they, they make the battle. Ah, but one, one is a warrior and he will bring the others back. That is from Heraclitus, Greek philosopher on uh, what it means to be a warrior in the call of duty. And when it comes to being a courtroom warrior, there really is nobody, uh, in my opinion, that really has has the same kind of like energy level about being a trial advocate as Rob. He uh, graduated from North Carolina Central University uh, School of Law in 2000. Um, after passing the bar, he went to work as a prosecutor at the Mecklenburg County DA's office for over a decade. Um, uh, he spent his last four years as a homicide prosecutor, um, uh, did all kinds of violent uh, felonies and 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 uh, a ton of felony trials while he was at the DA's office, um, and then entered private practice in 2012. Rob will tell you that he loves trying cases. It's really kind of like what makes him feel most alive. Uh, as he says on today's today's episode, uh, as, a, as a kid growing up, wasn't the greatest at sports, couldn't sing, but he felt like he felt like he was made to be in the courtroom. And that that really is the the mentality that Rob has. He loves taking cases to trial. Um, he has served uh, at several law schools as an adjunct professor. Uh, he's taught uh, trial and courtroom procedures as well as helped coach mock trial team. And so uh, this this idea of being a trial advocate, uh, trial advocacy, yes, he's taught the course trial advocacy, but uh, he also is an advocate for taking cases to trial. And so it is really uh, great to hear from somebody that has such a passion for criminal defense and particularly for trying cases. I really enjoyed speaking with Rob and hope you guys enjoy today's episode. So Rob, excited to uh, to, to kind of talk all things criminal defense with you and you know maybe a good like kind of jump off point is 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 tell us how you got into this into this crazy world what made you think that criminal criminal defense would be a good uh a good place to focus on yeah and it's not something that i probably thought um this was the path i was going to be on initially when i went to law school probably like many people we go to law school with an idea of doing something and then you sort of get um got into a different direction. It so wasn't I my had, path. I, I was yeah. all real estate. I, I, I was, I was going to be going to be into the, into the real estate. And then, uh, we, I went into law school in 2006, 2007 rolled around and things, things didn't look so good on the real estate front at that point. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, so I thought I was going to do um, intellectual property, probably specifically patent law, because I had a I have a technical background from NC State, and I knew a couple of guys. Um, I majored in physics, and I had some friends who were in the engineering program who ended up going to Central a couple of years before me, North Carolina Central School of Law, a couple of years before I did. Um, so I went to Central with that in mind, and then maybe too well. 3L year, I was on the trial team and enjoyed that. So when you're doing the process of interviewing, um, you know, the third, you know, your third year, 
I, did, I interviewed with a couple of patent law firms, but I made it known that I wanted to go to trial. And then they were telling me that, well, we hardly ever go to trial. <laughs> I probably like maybe once a year, if that. Um, so then specifically how I got into this area, once I got the letter saying, because I was living in Durham at the time, and then you got the letter saying that you passed the bar and you could request where you wanted your ceremony to be, whether it was going to be in Durham or, um, you know, another location. So I just picked Charlotte because, well, I figured my family's in Charlotte. It's just easier for me to go back to Charlotte as opposed to everybody coming up to um, um, Durham. And the person who introduced me was now the Honorable Gary Henderson, who's a district court judge in Mecklenburg County. So Gary introduced me to the bar with Judge Henderson introduced me to the bar and I knew him from high school. Um, so we went to the same high school. He was a year ahead of me and we went to central. He was a year ahead of me at central. Um, so I knew him from that aspect. So I'd asked him to introduce me. So during the ceremony, we go up to the front and he says, Hey, this is Rob Corbett. He's interested in litigation. So if you have a job opening, you know, talk to him. And the elected district attorney at the time, Peter Gilchrist came up to me after the ceremony and said, if you want to try cases, then send us your resume. Um, so then I started working in the DA's office um, December of 2000. So graduated May 2000, started working in the DA's office December of 2000, up until summer 2012. And I've been doing criminal defense ever since then. Yeah, a couple of, uh, couple of things that like pull, pull out of that. First of all, there's no better letter to get than that letter stating that you've had. There's like that, isn't that the best piece of mail you've ever received in your life? <laughs> well, I said, and like for me, like my parents got it because I had it sent home. So as soon as I picked up the phone, they said, "Hey, you passed." So I said, "Okay." Well, <laughs> so it was. It wasn't. You didn't have to. You didn't have to. The dread uh, tremble, of say, "Here's the letter." You know, as you uh, undid that seal. <laughs> yeah. yeah. No, that was the that was the best piece of mail I've ever gotten in my life. So. Um, but, but I, th I think, uh, you know, on the trial, uh, team side of things, it's, it's, um, I feel like that is such valuable exposure to get, not only in terms of like the actual mechanics of, 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 you know, kind of getting that experience while you're in law school, but also I think kind of like, you know, finding out what it is that you want to do. Like there's not too many, too many opportunities. I don't feel like in law school that you can kind of get a sense of, you know, here's an aspect of the law that I really, you know, want to want to practice. Not not just like an area of law to kind of like focus on, but like this is kind of what I want to be doing as a lawyer. And I think that that trial team um, side of things really really provides that for me. Moot court did the same thing. Like you know, I, I did moot court for a couple of years, and um, the second year uh, we did uh, the. Uh, competition up at Seton Hall Law School. I can't remember the, the specific name of the competition, but it was a criminal uh, procedure question that um, that was being briefed. And that whole experience was like, this is that that was what it was for me. It was like, I, this is what I want to want to do after after law school is is kind of argue uh in in front of somebody and 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 criminal law was really like that that was the passion point um so so in terms of your experience on the um the mock trial team like how did that you know kind of how did did you think that that translated well in terms of some of the skills that you learned there into the DA's office and then as a criminal defense attorney what what did that kind of oh, experience yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And I mean, I can say I, I love trial team, uh, still keep in contact with um, three of my main coaches. When I was in law school, I've had the opportunity to um, coach mock trial teams, um, coach the team at Central during COVID because you know, everything was by Zoom, um, as well as coach for several years at Charlotte School of Law when, you know, when the school was still open. And, you know, we had success there, like winning national tournaments or placing. But in terms of the question, how trial team prepares you about, and, you know, I, I taught trial ad as well as That's Central awesome. and um, Charlotte. So, uh, you know, I tell students, you know, in class or as well on trial team that if what you do in mock trial, what you do in trial advocacy class, that is going to put you ahead of at least 80% of the people in district court who have not taken that in terms yeah. of going against new attorneys, um, because you're already comfortable with the procedures, you're comfortable with the the rules of evidence. Um, and I think it just, it gives you um, that, that leg up. 
So in terms of going to district court, um, and because like Peter Gilchrist's um, philosophy, you know, you know, that time was that, hey, he wanted his new ADAs because it was a smaller office. Now the office has probably 80 plus ADAs and <laughs> they're small. still understaffed. So we probably had wow. half of that at the at the time. And his philosophy was that he wanted his new ADAs, you know, to be, you know, within a month, you know, being able to run the courtroom by themselves. Um, cause we didn't have a lot of, um, you know, partners at that time, just went enough, you know, to go around, I guess. So, although you have that, that stress level, uh, in terms of, Hey, you know, every day, you know, new cases coming in, people, you know, uh, you know, going to trial, you have that naturally, but the, like I said, being comfortable with, you know, trying a case comfortable yeah. in terms of the objections, um, that's invaluable experience. And I, I suggest every, if possible, like, you know, if you're going into that area or, you know, you're going into wanted to work in, in a prosecutor's office or public defender's office, then you absolutely should take the trial advocacy class and, you know, try to be on trial team. Yeah. And I, I think that in terms of those opportunities, you know, public defender's office uh, or, or uh, DA's office, just that, that, that many trials. Like, I, I think that part of the reason why um, I, I, I think a big reason why so many attorneys don't try cases is just, fear and you know concern of like looking silly in front of the in front of the judge i mean it's a legitimate fear but i think the easiest way to get over it is to just like try cases you know the the good the bad and the ugly and i think that when, when you're when you're kind of used to putting it's like okay let's throw that next case up for for trial like let's you know let's let's put it in front of the judge there, there's a real value in that um, you know, just practice, you know, there's just this kind right. of, you know, muscle practice, memory, and, you know? yeah, muscle memory of, of, uh, you know, being used to that. Whereas I think when you're, when you're a new lawyer, you're trying to figure out every, everything else that comes along with practicing, um, in the, uh, in the private bar, you, you know, uh, you know, you can get thrown off your game just by, you know, some random objection from the other table. You know I mean? <laughs> you just like it, you, you want everything, you know, as, as figured out as possible. And that's, that's just not the way that district court works, but trial always bring, brings those, um, you know, additional unknowns. So I think that that muscle memory that you're talking about is huge. So, so in terms of, you know, kind of your specific um, practice and, and kind of, you know, the, the lessons that you've taken from, you know, uh, uh, working in the DA's office and kind of figuring out what the, um, you know, kind of way of, of, of trying cases, what is your kind of uh, case preparation look like on a case that you think is headed to trial? What does that, what does that look like in terms of conversation with the client? What are you preparing? And obviously it's different uh, for every case and, and depending on the type of charge, but what are some of the kind of general practice tips that you have? Sure. Uh, so I would say probably majority of my caseload is superior court and serious felonies. And that's probably byproduct of by the time I left the DA's office, that's all I was handling anyway. Um, and that Megamer DA's office is divided up into teams. So okay. I was only in district court for a year. And then for like 10 and a half, I'm in superior court. And then the last four or so I was there, it was, I was just doing homicide cases. So when I made the the transition, I just, it was just a natural, um, affinity, comfortability in terms of being in superior court. Even now, I prefer not to go to, to district court, um, you know, virtue of my age. And then I'm dealing with um, ADAs, you know, in their early 20s. So I'm like, I'm double um, their age. <laughs> ADAs keep getting younger. Um, and not, like I'm staying the same age, but they, they keep getting younger every day. Um, and then having to beg, feel like I'm begging someone over a speed, about a speeding ticket. Uh, <laughs> You know, so I, I, I do, you know, go, you know, you know, people call speed and take, you know, you go down there and handle it, but I prefer, you know, just to stay out of there. So when you say in terms of preparation, I look, as soon as I get a case, I'm thinking long-term in terms of what is this going to look like for trial? Um, you know, whether, you know, obviously whether it goes or not, but I'm thinking long-term in terms of what's my possible theme, what's our, you know, a, a defense, if, if any, you know, that, that, that we may have. Um, so I'm th going through that during that entire time. Um, I'm not, you know, 
in terms of memorizing every piece of discovery, um, that won't happen in terms of it's in that trial posture of it has a set date. And then as we're getting closer, then I'm, I'm, I'm doing that. Preparation has changed over over time um, in that I remember first homicide case I had um, as a defense attorney. I, I printed off every single piece of paper. Um, in a homicide case, it is thousands uh, of pages. I printed off every single piece of paper. I subpoenaed every police officer um, just so the DA the, tried to pull something that they weren't going to call somebody. And I thought they wanted, needed to be needed. I had everybody on standby. I filed every affirmative defense. Um, DA even had a hearing and saying Corbett has filed every affirmative defense. They obviously conflict with each other. You can't file every one. <laughs> and I was like, Hey, I'm following everything. I know what the rule is as long as I withdraw prior to jury selection. So like everything's on the table. Um, and I, I say that to say that it is, my preparation has morphed um, over over time. Um, so now, in terms of as I, you know, as I'm thinking of a case, it is more important to me to um, be open and receptive to the highs and lows that are going to happen during the trial. And that an opening is going to come. They always come. Um, no one is because it's going to be as long as your witnesses are sequestered. Um, you know, how many times like the DA will prep somebody, your opening's always going to come and it's being receptive in terms of to recognize it and even adapt and kind of change how you were thinking or what all this defense is going to look like, being able to adapt and change and, and use that. Um, I, I still, I go back and forth in terms of, because like with technology, sometimes I go back and forth, whether like just printing out everything still as a hard copy or now everything is like digital. Um, we get discovery digital format. So I just bring my laptop, um, but and still have certain items that I want to print out because if I want to use them for um, impeachment purposes in terms of with a client. Um, and my philosophy, I know, is 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 different from others. And I'm not even saying that the way I view it is correct. Um, but there have been times if we're, you know, I, I do do some appointed work. I do less now than um, I did earlier. And that's virtue of inventory just just gotten so large. Um, and I think it was limiting my um, being effective and being on top of, 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 of things. But my philosophy is different is that I, I've never it's only probably once of where I have told a client emphatically, you have to plead guilty. Um because I just don't go in doing that. Because sometimes, you know, I've gone in cases of where attorneys have done that or clients have felt that their previous attorney has done that. And you don't want to lose um, that relationship of where the client thinks, okay, you're just, you're like, you're with the DA. You're just out to get me. Yep. You just want me to plead guilty. Yep. Um, so I, for me, it is more of, you know, this is what the DA is going to do. This is what I anticipate the DA will be able to do, be able to prove, um, and this would be the defense you ha would have to present because your defense is, you know, based in part on how they're going to, the prosecutor is going to present their case. So this is how you have to combat that. And you have to, and this is my opinion in terms of how effective that would be or how I think that argument is going to sound to a jury. But ultimately it has to be your choice. I support you either way. Um, but I'm not going to, you know, browbeat you and say, Hey, you, you have to do this. You have to do this, especially as we're as we're leading up to trial, um, because I recognize people need to be locked in. Um, so the DA makes a counter offer. Obviously, I'm telling the client, uh, and I tell the client, if you change your mind, hey, uh, you know, let me know. Or the DA has said, even in trial, if you want to make an offer, you know, you can still do that. But I recognize the client needs to be locked in, and and frankly, I, I do too, to a certain extent. Of I know if client's not going to take an offer then I need to make sure that I am as prepared as possible. Um, so, so I kind of touched on yeah, a couple of yeah, different no, things. Yeah, that, I think there's was... a couple of kind of follow-up questions that I have based on that. The first one is, I think um, uh, in terms of telling a story uh, on your case, you said kind of early on in the preparation, you're kind of like developing a theme for the case. And I think, you know, as, as storytellers, which is, I think in a jury trial, a big part of what we are doing is, is, is uh, communicating the story. Um, 
you know, I think that that theme can have a really powerful uh, impact, even in district court, obviously closing, you're kind of trying to get maybe a, a little bit outside of here's the black and white uh, rules, you know, uh, beyond reasonable doubt, like kind of communicating, here's the story of the case. But I think particularly when it comes to talking to a jury, that that kind of story element or theme element is important. So kind of one of the questions that I have is you, you kind of mentioned that theme is something that you're trying to develop early on. W- what is your process for doing that? What does that look like in terms of developing a theme for the case? Uh, for me, and I, I know and this kind of goes back in terms of you know, experience with trial team or when I was coaching, there are people who have um, that skill in terms of their themes can be flowery, sort of like poetic language. And that's not how I'm, I'm, I'm wired. Uh, so for me, my theme is always, um, I describe it as like the the elevator pitch of someone, you know, gets, you know, gets an elevator with you and they're going to the next floor and they say you're in trial, they say, yeah, they say, hey, just tell me what that trial is about. And you have like 30 seconds um, to describe it. So my theme is always sort of like that short pitch that I think just kind of encompasses what I think my case is about. And it's not going, you know, I don't want to, to oversell it, especially like in, in opening, um, because in terms of I don't know what is and what isn't going to come in. Yes. And I don't want to represent something to the jury where the jury says, ah, you told us that this is what it was going to be about. And then evidence doesn't quite go the way I anticipated. And now I've lost credibility. Is that something that when you sit down with the client and start to develop that theme, is that something that kind of, uh, obviously it might, might change, but something that you kind of carry with throughout the discovery process. And then as you're going into trial, something that you're kind of, um, mentally, you know, kind of going back to in terms of building something that you're presenting to the uh, uh, jury at closing. So through um, uh, uh, voir dire and then into the opening and through how the testimony is coming out. Is that something that you're kind of got in the the back of the mind that this is this is part of what I want to deliver in closing? Um, yes and and no. The the part where you said in terms of. Um, you know, if I'm paraphrasing, if it's something that I may workshop with clients. So I right. don't necessarily do that. Uh, I may tell the client in terms of, hey, this is what our case is about. Um, so I do it in terms of that aspect. But in terms of making sure that it, it carries through that, absolutely. In terms of everything from the moment I start speaking to them to closing should have something of theme related. Meaning that during voir dire, um, I'm getting, I'm trying at least to, you know, to get that across. Hopefully, I'll do that. I'll do a decent job on that come next week. But you know, I'm trying to get that across through questioning. I'm trying to get that across as well, um, you know, during um, cross examination, and then as hopefully tying it all together in closing. Hey, podcast listeners, I want to briefly interrupt today's episode to invite you to join me at the inaugural Freedom Fighter Summit in Asheville this October. This in-person only event is designed for growth-minded lawyers determined to take their criminal defense practice to the next level. Due to the size of the summit's venue, there are a limited number of seats available. Don't miss out on the incredible lineup of speakers and spectacular networking opportunity that this summit provides. For more details, visit www.minniclaw.com forward slash summit. Enter the promo code NCDWIGUY, all lowercase, all one word at checkout for $150 off your summit ticket. Look forward to seeing you there. Now back to the show. A lot of the things that happen in district court and superior court are very uh, are very similar. But then I think when you're communicating to a jury versus a district court judge, there are some pretty big changes. And I think the storytelling piece is a, a big difference. I think in district court, it's very much kind of like, um, here's the facts, what 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 law applies to that. You kind of get familiar with how a district court judge rules on certain things. You, you, if you've been practicing in the same place for a long enough period of time, um, you, you kind of are able to tell, you know, this, this judge is going to find this particular set of circumstances to be an issue. But there's not, again, really that like um, import in terms of uh, kind of communicating a theme or a story about your individual client's case. It's kind of like in their mind, 
I've heard this a thousand times in the past. Like I've seen this kind of case. I, you know, I know where this fits into my, um, uh, uh, kind of, uh, uh, you know, past experience of other similar, similarly situated cases. And when you have a jury that is this kind of like fresh slate of ideas, uh, again, um, you get to kind of like paint the picture, so to speak, of of what they are here to decide, what what they're here to to kind of think through. And so, you know, that theme part of it is really interesting to me because I think it is so unique to the or not you you know. It's not that you don't do it in district court, but different in how in terms of how that plays into superior court cases. Right. Yeah. So I mean, because like with the with the trials in in district court, probably just kind of like quick and dirty, just get up there. Yeah. But I do say, and and maybe like I say, if it's a virtue of just having in general more experience in superior court, I do try to do the cases the same way. Yes. Um, yeah. in district that I do in superior in terms of I'm making the the same objections and have even probably stated, you know, more than once, you know, something along the lines of what is going on now would not be allowed upstairs. And if it's right. not allowed upstairs, it shouldn't be allowed here. Um, so if the prosecutor is, is playing fast and loose um, with introducing evidence, then I, I'm making the same objections that I would in a superior court trial. Yeah, I love that, and I I love the the phraseology of that too. If, it, if it, this wouldn't be allowed upstairs, I think that that's a good a good um, uh, kind of thing to keep in the back of the mind because there there really is you know a little bit more play I would say in district court sometimes with with evidence rules and 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 you know how things are getting admitted and even in terms of the consideration I think one of the uh, uh, ways that that I really like doing this and I picked up on this from a um, a judge that would always kind of uh, phrase his verdict in terms of I don't think a um, jury of twelve would find your client guilty, or I think a jury of 12 would, would find your client guilty. And so, you know, in terms of even communicating and closing, I think it's good to kind of reference that to the, to the jury. I mean, you know, this is, you know, that's what you're sitting here um, as judges, a jury of 12 and, and kind of reminding them of the, of the role that they have. So I like that way of, of uh, talking about it in the evidence framework. Yeah. And um, I think I, I, I make the, the same argument in terms of, you know, I usually say in terms of, you know, court sits as a jury of one, um, but a, a jury of 12, you know, all 12 would not be fully satisfied or entirely convinced yes. of, you know, the evidence has been presented in this trial. Yeah, I think that's a powerful way to, to frame it. I mean, it really, it really is. It, ma- it makes the, the court think about, you know, that, that you know, again, it, it is a <laughs> unanimous decision in district court every single time, <laughs> you know, <laughs> that, that, that kind of pulls you out of that, out of that mindset. So the other thing that I wanted to kind of just ask a question about is in terms of your communicating with the client, kind of um, uh, having the mindset personally of, how am I preparing this case to go to trial from the moment that that kind of call comes in or the first time that I'm sitting down with the client? And I really do think that there is there is like a nose uh, that, that people have. And I think that this is true, whether you are a career criminal or if you've never been in trouble in your life. Um, I think that there is a nose that people have about whether your attorney is is thinking about taking your case to trial and, and, you know, then feeling the freedom from that response of, okay, well, I almost can take a plea because I think that this person would go the distance. I think there really is a differentiator in that kind of mindset of, you know, basically the default position is trial. Like if, if we decide that a plea is a better, a better approach than great. But, um, I do think that that has such a, like a powerful, um, uh, kind of powerful uh, impact in terms of of the client uh, having you know candid conversations and 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 you know being involved in in their own defense. Um, so, so kind of how how do you communicate that to the client in terms of of that you know wh- you know kind of trial readiness? What what specifically do you do in terms of those conversations? Well, yeah. And so at our first meeting, um, you know, I'm, in terms of I'm making that known to the client that I follow in terms of their lead in terms of meaning that if they tell me that 
look, I'm looking to get probably the best resolution possible, best plea possible. That's what we're, you know, we're, we're working towards. If they find themselves in the mindset of it doesn't matter what the offer is, I just can't take it because, you know, I have based on what I have going on now in my personal life, just take me, you know, sometimes just probation is too much. Um, they say, look, I just can't take anything. But, you know, the client says, look, I want to take this to trial. We get to the point I want to take this to trial. Then I tell them that that's what we do. That's what we we, we get ready for. Um, so for me personally, trial is what I enjoy the most, even though I will complain um, about it or complain about the the frequency. But it's like being the you know the grumpy old man just wanting to complain like for 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 no reason, so to speak. But that's what I enjoy. But I reckon I, you know trial isn't best for for every client. Um, you know, so I would prefer probably my schedule not to be or go with the frequency that, that I do go at, you know, at times. But because of that, um, I do think the clients do we say in terms of, you know, clients can, you know, can tell that they can they get that sense that I'm not a, afraid to go. Um, so they know, hey, Corbett's not afraid to go to trial if that's, you know, what, what we have to do. Now, obviously, can't guarantee you, you know, a result and the odds are against us. And I was at a CLE a couple of weeks ago where they said, if you get a not guilty or a hung jury, you need to throw a party because the system is designed for you not to pre prevail. Um, but you need people who are willing to stand in that gap and, and you know, and hold the state um, so that, you know, hold the state to that burden. So, you know, even if you don't, you don't prevail in this case, then they know that, hey, we have to make sure we have everything the next time, you know, we see them. Yeah, there's there's an attorney here in uh, in our area that does a lot of uh, superior court work, and he uh, he kind of always is phrasing things, even in in kind of conversations with clients, as um, you know, uh, when this case goes in front of the jury, or here is what the jury is going to to think about this issue. And I think one thing that that does for the client is really put things in perspective of okay, this this case is going to trial and it's kind of in my court to say you know uh, let, let's let's you know move towards a plea depending on what the what the offer what the offer is I, I think one of the uh, the things that really um backfires is is you know there's been times in my practice where I felt like the best thing for the client was uh, a plea. I mean, you know that this, you know, this is really what makes sense. We just don't have a great argument if the case goes to trial. But it's one of those things where it's it's the same thing in uh, in your your relationship with your significant other. You want that to be like their idea, not your idea. You know, <laughs> and so you know, how do you kind of communicate? Well, here's what this looks like. If we go to trial, here's the things that are going to be, uh, 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 you know, pulled out, and not like I am pigeonholing you into, into this, into this plea. So I think that even even just having that mentality of, um, uh, you know, I I like taking cases to trial, and I I enjoy um, pushing cases. I think clients really do pick up on that, um, and that only comes through as as you kind of are you know are living proof of taking a lot of cases to trial, like not being afraid of being in the courtroom, not being afraid of pushing that. It really is like, you know, in this situation, I don't feel like our chances are good, but again, we're going to push it that direction if that's what you want to push. And I think, again, I feel like clients generally have a pretty good nose for that of, you know, is this really my case being bad or is this attorney just not wanting to spend the extra time and energy pushing the case to trial? All right. And I think, unfortunately, uh, you know, and, you know, we can we can kind of kind of see that um, of where because you get a sense of, you know, who which attorneys are are willing or, or go to trial. Um, and, you know, if, if you're in the courthouse any amount of time, people kind of like know or at least like, you know, much your, you know, your 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 peers in terms of For people sure. know, like, yeah. you know, we were the ones that are, are going to trial or whose names end up more frequently on the trial calendar than others. Yeah, for sure. And I, you know, again, I, I think that, you know, some, some, uh, 
some clients may even have that knowledge, you know, whether it's from, from some sort of a referral or, or whatever it might be, they may have that kind of understanding of this is a person that is going to, you know, take it the distance if that's what, what needs to happen. So, I mean, I definitely think that that plays a big, a big factor. And I think, you know, uh, circling back to, to all the way to the beginning of our conversation, I think the, the, the point that I am, uh, hearing, and I think is, is a, a joint point is, you know, take cases to trial when you can, like, if that makes sense, push, push cases to trial. Don't be afraid of, of trying cases. I think that there is, um, you know, again, when, when there's, when there's nothing to lose, that's generally the the best, the best option. And, and for, for me, I do a lot of, you know, DWI cases, um, and so, you know, there, there are times when, you know, there's, there's a lot on the line, but there are other times when the plea is going to be the same as taking the case to trial, the client's right. already there. And it's like, well, let's, let's, let's push it. You know, I mean, there's not, there's nothing here that can, um, you, you know, uh, it, is to be lost from, you know, from having our day in court. So, um, I think, you know, having, having that kind of a mentality really can be, uh, powerful. And again, then it allows you to kind of have a little bit more credibility. I think even personally down the road, when, when you're having those tough conversations with clients that really do have to decide what is the right path for me in terms of pushing it to trial or entering a plea. Excuse me. Right. So I've had those conversations of where you're speaking with client and, you know, you're telling them that, look, based on what this offer is, we can go to trial and lose and with the right judge, you're going to get, I mean, all things, because um, more than one charge, you say, yeah, judge certainly can run everything consecutive. Right. But based on, you know, maybe age, record, background, you can end up with at or about the same offer that the DA is making. Right. So that's not really an, an offer. Right. If you say I can go to trial and get the same thing. Right. Yeah, for sure. Uh, yeah. I mean, that's, that's absolutely the situation. Yeah. It, it, you know, because you do so much um, superior court work and, and have, you know, uh, you know, a lot of jury trials in terms of the, the way that you do jury selection or any kind of tips in terms of, of uh, communications to the jury, um, what, what can you share with us, Rob, on that front? Cause I know that's a, a big part of your practice. Yeah. And I am, um, I tweak my jury selection, um, for every trial. So I haven't, um, there's some questions, uh, or order of questions that, um, I do, but I'm always tweaking and trying to, um, to do better. The one thing that I do, and I did this even as a prosecutor, it was easier. No, I'm sorry. It was easier. It's easier now than when I was a prosecutor is that, uh, first thing I do is that I greet everyone by name. I, I memorize everybody's name. And I only bring that up because um, more often than not, jurors, you know, if you, when I speak to them afterwards, they always say, wow, I really like that you did that. Uh, well, as a prosecutor, I, I do the same in terms of I memorize everyone's name. And obviously that was harder because I get like maybe a couple of minutes from judge during his or orientation. And I, I'm spending that time making sure I've memorized everyone's name. Now the DA is going to spend a couple hours to a day. Um, so I have it down pat. But I greet everybody by name. Um, it is important, and I, I, I try to do this more, that I'm asking more open-ended questions. I think a lot of times you see people, uh, especially maybe prosecutors, and, you know, because I, I did the same, is that we are focused on teaching um, to the jury. So yes. we're asking a, a yeah. lot of leading questions and, you know, do you, you know, wouldn't you all agree that, that this is appropriate, you know, questions along those lines. And there is that social pressure, so to speak, that people want to say the, to agree with you. Um, no one wants to be out on an Island by themselves. So by me asking more open ended questions, um, cause I'm telling them it's better for, I mean, I know what I think. Uh, I know what the prosecutor thinks about this. Uh, we know what the judge thinks, but that's not important. What's important is what you all think about these topics. So, you know, I kind of tell them in advance that I'm going to ask you these questions, but I need to know what you all think. And so get them speaking more. Um, and also, um, in addition, to asking more open ended questions, um, sort of following up or you say like looping in that I'll I'm talking to juror number one and they give me a response. And then I may ask like juror number seven in terms of, hey, what do you think about that response? And you tell me like your thoughts on it and try to like to go along that way. Yeah. Um, I, I like that a lot. Hard. I think that that is a big, a big, uh, 
practice uh, because it's so hard to get the jury to talk sometimes. And so I think when you can ask a specific question of of one particular juror, get get a kind of like meaningful response, and then turn it to somebody directed at somebody else, or or um, you know, kind of open it up to the rest of the group. I feel like sometimes in the past when I've asked these open ended questions of the entire jury there's not a lot of response. But then when I zero in on one person and, and kind of like pull them into, into offering a response that then allows for other jurors to feel more, um, more free in terms of having a idea about that point. Again, the jurors, I don't want to look stupid in front of a bunch of people in this like very intimidating space that I'm in. So getting that, that communicate, I love, I love that. I love that point. Sorry to cut you off, Rob. But oh, no. I just and love also, that. like best thing, one of the best things I've heard is where um, I uh, heard this attorney had like his notes already. It was like his first jury trial, and it was with um, I guess a senior partner he had his notes out, and he's about to start questioning. And then the co counsel just took the notes away and says, "You don't need this. Just talk." <laughs> um, you know, he said he said that was like best advice he had. Like, <laughs> we just need to talk and try to the, the build that rapport with him. Yeah. Yeah, that and I, I think by I mean that's to me one of one of the advantages of the defense. And I think you've just kind of brought this out really well because you sat at both tables, but one of the advantages of the defense is personality. And I mean it's not to say that every every dis, district attorney is a stick in the butt. I mean, that's not the 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 case, but again, there is like a a volume that is being kind of like cranked through on that side of the table a lot of the times where it's kind of like the preparation in terms of trial from what I've observed. And again, maybe you, you think differently having lived it is so much focused on, I've got to have like all of my witnesses lined up and figure out, you know, uh, how I'm going to be communicating this all to the victim. And so jury selection generally is not the thing that is like the, the, the mass, the mass place where you're putting your attention in. It's kind of like making sure, do, am I proving all of these specific these specific elements. It's not to say that's not where the focus should be. I just, from, from my perception of the state, it's very much been that like, kind of, it feels like a form is getting, you know, read off um, uh, in terms of the back and forth, very much educational. And, you know, uh, what we, do you promise to follow the law? Do you promise to, um, uh, you know, abide by the judge's instructions that he gives you? You know, it's, it's very much this kind of, you know, yes, man, response. And so I right. think that we can, you know, really capitalize on that opportunity to be again, a, a personality and, and, and really allow our client to, to kind of have, um, a personality through us vicariously to some extent. Yeah. And if you're in like the juris a jurisdiction that allows you to do that, you, you know, it should absolutely, I remember like years ago, um, I mean, a prosecutor at the time, I knew there was a defense attorney of, uh, you know, obviously don't remember the person's name, but just took like the first 12, um, you know, say, Hey, all the questions have been asked and just like took the first 12. But so if you have the opportunity uh, to do that, absolutely take it. The reason I bring that up in terms of comparing and contrasting, for instance, in federal court, um, you know, I don't do a lot of federal court practice, but I've had a few jury trials up there. Um, and it's judge driven in that the judge is the one asking the questions, um, you know, um, I've had like one judge of where would give attorneys like half an hour, you know, after he asked the questions, like to do their board year, had, had another judge of where he would ask all the questions in federal court. And then at the end, he'd ask if you had any questions that you'd like to submit for him to ask. So you say, hey, I'd like for you to ask this. He's like, nah, I'm not going to do that. You know, so and it, it's harder to gauge. Well, wow, that's, um, yeah, that, that's, you know, you jury tough. that way. Yeah, that's because tough. Like, I mean, I, yeah, I, th I, th I think the more the more that you can, um, you know, I, th I think part of it is, you know, you're trying to kind of like pull out bias, but but in my early years of practice, that's kind of what I primarily was driving my questions at. And what I thought was like, my role was trying to kind of like identify jurors to remove from the the panel. But, um, you know, with, with more and more experiences like this, this is my opportunity to have a conversation and kind of get you know, what, what individual people are thinking, what is this, what is this group going to be thinking? What, what ideas are kind of prominent, you know, how are they, how do they see reasonable doubt? What do they, you know, what, what do they think of some of these, these topics that we're discussing? And again, I, I think it's, you know, uh, it, it's, it's, 
for me individually, I am not the best people reader when it comes to, is this juror going to be a, a good, a good juror for my jury or not? But I think what, what can be done through that is like figuring out what, it, where, where is the tone of this juror? What, what, what kind of points are going to land and what points are not going to land? And so that's been something that I've kind of shifted to a little bit. Yeah. Cause I uh, had a, a colleague who said that, you know, you're not so much as picking a jury or like picking people that you want, but kind of like picking the people that you like the least. Right. Uh, right. Cause you said, right. like, Hey, I'm not going to have, I know I'm not going to have all 12 um, yeah. who are going to be, you know, in my favor. So let me kind of get rid of the people um, that, you know, that I like the least who are definitely uh, against not on me board. Against me. <laughs> yeah. That's a good, I think that's a good way, a good way of looking at it. Well, I, you know, one thing that I've really, um, enjoyed Rob in terms of, you know, we, we, uh, it's, it's, it's been awesome actually getting to kind of like talk with you, uh, today, uh, because I, I've, I've been a long time, like follower of, of you on LinkedIn and Facebook and, and kind of seeing different things that you post. And one of the things that I really appreciate about, um, your, uh, kind of love of what you do is that you, you share things, um, uh, on social media that I think really reveal that, that you're, you're a passionate criminal defense attorney. You know, I can remember specifically a post that you had several months back where it was a Saturday morning and you were leaving the jail and just kind of, you know, um, you've offered, offered a few thoughts about, you know, kind of the, this is, this is what I do. This is my, this is my life. And it was very, um, encouraging to me. I mean, it was just one of those things where it's like, this is, this is a cool club to be a part of. So in terms of, you know, any, anything, um, you know, uh, that, 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 uh, you, you could offer in terms of, you know, maybe, maybe some of the, uh, uh, you know, reasons behind that or, or, or kind of what, what, uh, you know, w- w- why you choose to share those things. I'd actually be kind of interested in that because it's, it's been again, a, a, a real like cheerleader moment for me in terms of like really loving the, loving the profession. Yeah, I, I think I kind of think of it. I sometimes say um, that I believe we all have certain gifts and talents um, that we've been blessed with. And when you are able to land um, in a field that you, I mean, you honestly feel that, hey, this is what I, I, I was I was meant to do. This sort of aligns with what I, I am as a person or what I, I can bring. That 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 is a, a a good feeling. That's why I say sometimes that we're, yeah, I'm gonna complain. I'm gonna complain this weekend <laughs> and all um about trial prep. But once when I'm in trial, I have described that as it, it's zen um, <laughs> That's for awesome. me. Um because I say I wasn't there are a lot of things I don't do well in this world in terms of uh, you know I wasn't you know I wasn't an athlete. I I cannot sing um, but I feel like I can, I can try a case. Um, I'm good at, at that. Um, so in terms of, you know, it's more of, you know, hope, hoping like it, it, you know, other people kind of like see that or, you know, or just commiserating in terms of just kind of sharing, just like free thinking. Um, so sometimes, you know, I'll, I'll do that maybe in terms, instead of keeping a journal. Um, maybe before social media I probably would have had yeah, a journal. That, that's what like, it feels like. Thoughts. Yeah. I, I feel like we get to kind of see behind the scenes and it's just, um, it, it's, it's just really refreshing to, to see that because it, it feels very, uh, uh, you know, th- th- there's, we're, we're getting behind the veil. It's, 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 you know, the, the integrity is definitely there in terms of, of the things that you share on that. But again, I think very, for me, it's been very uplifting, you know, s- seeing those um, posts. So I, I really appreciate you kind of sharing, you know, the behind the scenes of, of what goes on in your practice. All right. And, uh, you know, tell people in terms of, you know, lots of different things, um, you know, people can do with a, a law degree, but you are not going to beat the war stories uh, that, that that we have. <laughs> it's the yeah. most fun. I mean, it really is the most fun. There's no better group of people to hang around. <laughs> yeah. You know, as long as either going to be really great, fascinating stories, or they're just going to be macabre stories. And, you know, we are, are jaded and, you know, and, and they, we don't mind talking about them, but it's going to be like one of those two, but they're all, there's going to be interesting. That's why I like most of the, if there's a, a lawyer show is dealing with, you know, criminal law. Yeah. Oh, for majority sure. Majority of yeah. the time. 
Yeah, I mean that's that. That's it's definitely an interesting, an interesting profession. There's no no doubt about that. Well, but before we uh before we kind of end the end the call, Rob, in terms of advice for um young young uh, criminal defense lawyers, uh, for, you know, few years into practice or just getting ready to kind of kind of start, what what advice or tips would you have um for for practicing criminal defense? Um, don't be afraid to try cases. And when I say don't be afraid, you're you're always going to, oh, I think you should always have some of that fear. I think you get to the point of where you don't have any at all. Um, and maybe, you know, you might find yourself, hey, I'm just doing this by the numbers. But yeah, you, you should, but don't be, you know, don't let it be paralyzing. Yeah. Um, observe trials, um, trials from different people. I, you know, take stuff and modify from people all the time. I'll, I'll just go in there and, you know, we'll sit and watch people do cases. You know, if I have some, you know, down moment in court and then say, Hey, you know, I like that, or I would have done this differently or, or I like how that, that question is asked. I need to start incorporating um, that question um, in my voir dire. So, and, you know, also just, you know, ask, you know, talk to people, um, Trial lawyers by nature love to talk about themselves and their cases. Um, so, you know, talk to them as, you know, as they're leaving court or coming out, they'll tell you, you know, I, I called a colleague, um, had a good result in a, in a trial last week. I got a similar trial coming up this summer. Um, you know, so I send them a message. I say, Hey, when you got time, let me know when I can just talk to you. Like, so you can run that case down you know, with me. So I can kind of see in terms of how mine might relate to that. And if I, you know, can make a similar argument. Um, and also I think um, it is regardless of what side, which table you, you, you sit on, it is a, a, a noble profession. You need good people on both. I do feel like that. I help people more though on, on this side um, ran into former client, you know, yesterday of where uh we did a, a plea plea got um, we got like a revised offer because we were like going to take it to trial. Um, but, you know, he's out um, working. You know, he said, hey, Corby, see, I'm doing I'm doing good. Got me a new car, you know, pointed to it. He says, hey, but I got a family member uh, who has a similar issue that he had. He said, I want you to like to, you know, work with this case and say his case is better than mine. And, you know, we were going to take mine to trial, uh, <laughs> but his case is even better. So I said, OK, yeah, I'll, I'll give you a call. But that's that's good in terms of when you can like run into people. Uh, and this is like one last one where um, mention a federal trial. Uh, that's like my first federal trial. And unfortunately, that one because it's rare. Um, so that one that stands out because that one resulted in an acquittal um, and. To, to, you know, to be successful in federal court. And that guy, you know, packed up his family, moved across the country. Uh, he says, I'm out of this element. I don't need to be around these people that got me wrapped up in this. I mean, so that's good in terms of you get people like a, a second chance and what they do with that is on them. But when you can, um, it's a good feeling. Yeah, I love, I love all those points. I think that one reason why so many former DAs are really good defense lawyers is because they have the opportunity to see a bunch of other attorneys try cases. Like that's one of the the benefits that to like see all of these different styles of of defense and and you know how people are asking questions. It's a real advantage. And so I think that, you know, in particular that, you know, go go watch the 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 masters try cases in your neck of the woods. There really is no better teacher than that that observation other than doing it yourself. So hopefully you're you're doing it you're you're learning on the uh on the fly as much as you're kind of taking that in. But in terms of educational pieces, you can attend all of the um all of the CLEs and great, uh, great educational seminars that are out there. But when you watch somebody that really knows how to try a case, do it, there's just no, no better way to learn in my opinion. Yeah. You have to just get in there and do it. Absolutely. Well, well, Rob, it's been fun talking to you. I very much appreciate you coming on and sharing your wisdom with the audience. Uh, hey, thank you. And like, you know, anytime I know we had to play like phone tag for, for a little bit, but uh, I greatly enjoyed it. If there's opportunity ever presents itself again, just let me know. Definitely will. If you found the information in this podcast to be valuable, I simply ask that you pay it forward and share this podcast with another member of the legal community. 
Also, if you would leave us a rating or a review on whatever platform you are listening on, I would greatly appreciate it.